Okay, guys. Uh, we're back. More qualitative tests. Um, to talk about. Uh, please, uh, I don't know when you're watching this video, but please, if you haven't started to request uh, me to run qualitative tests on your unknowns, please do so. Um, Got to get going on this, yeah? Okay, so. Um, <coughs> First one I'm going to go over is the bromine test. Okay. Um, which is really intended as a test for alkenes and alkynes. Um, and as I'll talk about here in a second, it will uh, produce false positives sometimes with other compounds, other aromatic, particularly activated aromatic compounds. Um, and even though they are technically false positives for the bromine test, they actually can be informative um, for you. So, you know, are they false positives or are they just positive for a different type of test? activated aromatics. In any case, uh, in terms of alkenes and alkynes, um, what happens is if you add bromine, bromine is highly colored. So if you add bromine to a solution that has your unknown in it, um, the bromine, which is a deep red, um, if there's nothing to consume the bromine, it will stay red. The solution becomes red. Okay? But if there's something in there that consumes the bromine, then that deep red will disappear, and it'll just be the color, you know, usually just a, a clear color. Okay. So in this case, uh, the color change is actually going from deep red to clear. Okay. That's a positive test. If it's you add the bromine and you deep red stays red, that's a negative test. No alkenes and alkynes. Now this is a test that should be done on. All unknowns, okay? Um, <coughs> because these are not one of the primary functional groups, they're secondary functional groups. So, you know, you have to find your primary functional group, your one primary functional group of each unknown, right? Allied ketones, alcohols, esters, phenols, alcohols, ketones, I think I just did it, L and amines. But then it could also have one of the secondary functional groups, or two of the secondary functional groups, or three of them. It can have, uh, you know, there's no limit on the secondary functional groups, okay? Though they don't tend to be too crazy in their structure. Um, okay, so, should be done on all unknowns, all right? So, let's take a look at the mechanism. Say you had, um, your unknown was cyclohexene, okay? Again, um, I'm not going to use my red pen because it didn't show up very well on the video. So uh, this is a deep red color. <coughs> and, and this is reactivity. This mechanism, you guys know this mechanism. We've actually done this mechanism uh, first semester. We did it with um, still lead. So you get addition of the bromine across the double bond. The double bond goes away, and it's anti-addition. So that one of the bromines is sticking out at you guys, and one of the bromines is back in the hallway. Okay. I'll just arbitrarily draw it that way. Okay. That could have been the, um, the um, wedge or, and this, the dash. So, so. OK, so what's the mechanism, just to remind you? You can get uh, momentary dipoles, as we talked about last time, in a um, halogen in its elemental form. Okay? Uh, this halogen has lone pairs on it. This alkene can go out, attack that uh, bromine, kick off bromide. When it does that, it's going to abandon one of those carbons 
and know that carbon will have a carbocation. Well, before that carbocation could ever exist, one of these lone pairs says, oh, carbocation, I'm a localized set of electrons, I'm going to react, I'm going to bond. Okay? So it bites back on there, and what that means to you, if you remember, is a three-member ring. And that three-member ring is called a bromonium. Okay? And then you have your bromine. And your bromide, it's essentially an SN2 reaction at this point. Your bromide can, uh, as this is drawn, go back into the hallway, do backside attack on either of those carbons, and break that bond. <coughs> okay, so. Yeah, that's how I drew the final product. Those electrons get kicked there, and that directly gives you your final product. Okay. And this would be clear. Okay. Had your starting unknown been, you know, yellow or something like that, then this would be yellow. But that deep red color would be gone. Okay. Um, typically, when you're running this test, you have to. Um, uh, wait a couple of minutes, it, and you want to, in order to call it a positive test, you want to be able to add uh, like five drops of bromine and it disappears. Okay? Um, sometimes water and things in water can react with bromine a little bit, so one single drop and getting it to disappear, not good enough to call it a positive test. Okay? All right, so as I have mentioned, there are quote unquote false positives. Okay. Um, activated aromatics. Okay. What an activated, what is activated mean? What, what activated means is that you have some group that's electron donated. Okay, an electron donating group is usually a group that has a lone pair, okay, on the connecting atom, all right? Uh, so they are things, um, all um, orthoparadirectors. Well, I shouldn't say all orthoparadirectors, because there are some orthoparadirectors that aren't quite electron donating enough to call activated, activated aromatic. But um, a couple of examples are phenols could do this and anilines. What's an aniline? An aniline is an amine. Sorry, I drew that so small. It's an amine where the nitrogen is attached directly to the benzene ring. And then, of course, a phenol. Now, I would not use this uh, as a way to exclude phenol or anilines, okay? In other words, if you don't see uh, this false positive, don't assume, oh, I don't have a phenol. It didn't, it didn't do the false positive thing, which is, I'll explain what it does when, when you have an activated aromatic. But if it does do that, which is going to be a disappearance of the bromine, and you'll see fuming. The fuming is actually HBr, not HCl, but HBr. Okay. If you do see a disappearance of the bromine and you see fuming, okay, uh, then that is some good evidence that leans towards um, a an activated aromatic compound. And if you did that, then you might see. Well, do I have any other information that would imply that at least I know it's an aromatic compound? Okay, something that agrees with that. Well, I did the uh, soot test, right? Um, and I saw I saw smoke, so that implies conjugation. Okay? All right. So there are more than one thing uh, in all these tests that can sometimes give you information uh, or duplicate information. Okay? There's also stuff in NMR that would tell you if you have an aromatic compound. All right. Okay. 
So, um, so what happens, why do you get the disappearance of the bromine and you get the fuming? Well, it is electrophilic aromatic substitution. Okay? Uh, you have learned in here a little bit, and certainly in the lecture course, that you can't do electrophilic aromatic substitution typically without some type of catalyst. Uh, iron trichloride, iron trichloride, something like that. But if it's a highly activated aromatic, sometimes it can do electrophilic aromatic substitution in the absence of a catalyst. Okay. <coughs> and so uh, what I get here would be that key one? Well, that key one is when uh, these electrons come down here and make a double bond. Okay. And it gives you that key fourth uh, resonance structure that makes ortho or, uh, or sorry, ortho or para position favorable when you have an electron donating group. Um, 
But if you do have this happen, then that is some, some evidence that supports that you have a phenyl or an animal. Okay? All right, next one. Next test we're going to do is the uh, potassium permanganate test. That's also called the bear test. I'm not sure why, actually. I should look that up. Um, and it is really sort of a duplicate for, I really should probably teach the, the bear test first, actually. It's a duplicate in a sense. It also tests for, um, for alkenes and alkynes. They're very easy tests to run. So we have two of them that uh, sort of add to the information. Um, the, the Bayer test, or the potassium permanganate test, as it's also called, um, has lots of false positives. Okay? Potassium permanganate is extremely reactive. Okay? Potassium permanganate is another reaction uh, that you should do on both of your unknowns. Okay? Because, again, it's one of those secondary functional groups. No matter what your primary functional group is, it's still possible you have an alkene or an alkyne. Okay? So, this is the bare or um, I'm sorry. I'm going to draw, uh, going to draw my alkene. Uh, kind of funny. I'm using cyclohexene again. Not terribly creative. But uh, what I want to do is, is take a uh, flat uh, cyclohexene and sort of uh, turn it so it's towards you. Okay? Because I want the reagent to come under it. It's a little bit um, more telling to show the mechanism of that. Okay? So. We have um, KMNO4, all right? This is a uh, bright purple solution, all right? And um, if it reacts, what you get actually, and I think this is a reaction we had in Dr. Morgan's class. You get the same product that you get with osmium tetraoxide. Okay? You get a diol. All right? And it's what's known as a syn diol. It's on the same side. Okay, so you know, had I drawn it like this, um, you'd have your OHs on the side. Sin addition, as opposed to the bromine, which was anti addition. Okay? Alright, so <coughs> what does the mechanism here look like? Uh, well, it does a cycloaddition reaction. You've learned about a cycloaddition reaction um, in the form of Diels Alma reaction. Okay? This is a different type of uh, cycloaddition reaction. is permanganate. Okay. Um, this is obviously, or, or you know, now that I pointed out, perhaps it's obvious. Oh, I forgot that. The most important product, actually, is MnO2, manganese dioxide, okay, which is a brown precipitate. Okay. That's how you know you have a positive test. Okay, so how does the cycloaddition happen? Well, um, so this is an oxidation reaction, right? You've added more bonds to oxygen. <coughs> so the, um, the oxygen here attacks that carbon. Right? That 
takes these electrons and actually attacks the oxygen. You don't see that happen very often. The oxygen gets attacked by an electron pair. Okay? When that happens, these electrons pop onto the manganese. That gives you this adduct. Benzylic alcohols. Okay, remember that's an alcohol where on a carbon one removed from the benzene ring, there's the OH. Okay? The OH isn't actually on the ring, that would be a phenol. A benzylic alcohol is when where it's one away. Do one more test for this video. And after I do the one more test, I only have two more to do for all the qualitative tests. Yeah. Let me double check that out. Yes, that's the case. Right. Okay. Um, let me take this moment to remind you that um, two other tests that need to be done on both of your uh, unknowns, no matter what you found with the aqueous solubility, is the Bilstein test for uh, halides and the Soot test for conjugation. Okay? Halides are a secondary functional group. Conjugation would, you know, again imply a, a uh, alkene or a, some type of conjugation. So, and you can have those no matter what your primary function group is. Another reminder, you only have one primary function group of the, you know, allies, ketones, esters, amines, alcohols, minerals, and the uh, You only have one of those on each unknown, so don't draw two of them. Okay. All right. Last one I'm going to do is uh, the ferric chloride test. Kind of a cool mechanism uh, for phenols. Okay. Fuming in the bromine test was a false positive that could imply you have a phenol, but again, if you don't get that fuming and, and the disappearance of the bromine color, you can't uh, automatically assume you don't have a phenol. But on this test, this is a pretty uh, pretty reliable test for phenomenals. Okay. <coughs> All right. Um, so you have your phenol. Okay. And you have iron trifluoride or ferric chloride. Okay. And 
section of substitution reactions. Um, this is iron 3 plus, right? That's the oxidation state of that. Okay? Um, it is uh, very electrophilic. Okay? It's surrounded by chlorines. It's much more electronegative. This, so this is very strict of electron density, this iron 3 plus. Okay? Um, and you've got lone pairs on this oxygen, okay, which is attracted to things that are electron deficient. Okay? So what you end up getting is six phenols clinging on to the iron. Oops, sorry. All right. So rather than draw six phenols, what I'm going to do here, let's make it a different color. Um, okay, I'll draw brackets around like that, and then I'll draw six like that. Okay. Once that happens, this iron actually becomes three minus. All right. Um, you'll have three somewhat free protons that are associated. So this is a salt. Okay. Just like um, you can think of as um, HCl as a salt, actually. Okay. Um, so. And, and notice that the, the overall charge adds up to a neutral compound, neutral on this side, neutral on that side. Okay? You have a 3 minus anion, 3 plus uh, cation, or I should say 3 plus 1 cation, so overall neutral. Okay? And then you also have uh, three HCl molecules that get generated. Okay, so how does this happen? Well, you have your iron trifluoride. Like I said, it's very um, electron deficient that uh, iron is. Okay, so it's essentially a substitution reaction. The oxygen kicks off the chloride. <coughs> okay. That gives you. I'm going to twist that mole around a little bit. This guy plus HCl. Okay. Now, the exact same thing, another phenol, right? Ultimately, six phenols are going to be involved in attacking that iron. Okay? I'm not going to draw it out because it's just redundant. So, what we'll say is uh, we'll draw two arrows, yeah, and then we'll say two more times. Two times more, I guess. Okay? So that we end up with. At the end of that point, okay. that's two more ACLs. Okay. This iron is still surrounded by three oxygens. Okay, oxygen is very electronegative, so this is still fairly electron deficient. And there's a whole bunch of phenols still floating around, okay, so that they can actually just sort of glom on to that iron. Those three guys there. Now we've got this 
fourth phenol on here. Now, where exactly does the uh, proton stay in the oxygen, or is it someplace else uh, in this adduct? Um, it's hard to say, so that's why it's just sort of drawn this way. You have some of these phenol pieces that have an H on them, some that don't. Okay, so it's typically drawn that way. And then this process of a phenol coming in a towel, oh, sorry, um, this is now minus one, okay? Well, again, that can happen two times more. And you get this guy, and that is a blue, green, purple, can even be red sometimes. Okay, there's no, it's not quite like the DMP test where there's some way of, of rationalizing why the different color. Okay, you just can get a different color. You get it, and it's very pronounced. It's not, it's not a subtle, subtle change by any means. Okay. Um, one possible um, false positive that you can get, well, I guess I don't have to wait. I can erase, um, are what's known as carbonyls that can enolize easily. Okay. Now you may or may not have gotten to enolization of carbonyls yet. That's uh, typically one of the last things in organic life. Okay. So um, enolization of carbonyls. Okay. It turns out that any ketone or aldehyde, it's typically restricted to ketones or aldehydes, um, can rearrange to a different form. Okay, so it's just a rearrangement. So you've lost a proton here, now you have a, a, a CH2 here, and that proton is now attached to the oxygen. And okay, that's the enol form of that ketone, of the acetone, simplest ketone. Okay. 